respected chairperson sir professor padmavati distinguished colleagues friends ladies and gentlemen it is indeed an honor for me to have been awarded this oration which is in the name of dr p n chatani who was a legend i'd like to pay my tributes to him before i start um he was one of the outstanding physicians india has had he served as the director of the famous pgi chandigarh and uh, his awards if to be enumerated would compile a book um uh, if i'm able to achieve 25% of what he did in his life i would consider myself fortunate the topic of my oration is leprosy in children which is not a very popular topic and uh, why i went into leprosy i shall talk as we go along i bring greetings to you from my city which is the city of the taj mahal um which you have been seeing quite a few times since yesterday and why i show this slide is because just half a kilometer away from this monument stands the indian uh, council of medical research center for uh, research on mycobacterial diseases and it was with this collaborative work over the last 20 years that we have been able to compile our series on leprosy in children it was hansen way back in the year 1873 who discovered the leprosy bacillus and it's most unfortunate that even today we are struggling in terms of making a diagnosis of leprosy in children and of course if a diagnosis is not made how do we treat if we look at the global burden the statistics show that the global registered prevalence at the end of the first quarter of 2013 had 189000 cases the unfortunate bit is that 65% of all new cases of leprosy reported globally are from india today india stands out as the country which has the maximum number of patients of leprosy in the world if we see the trends this is the data which is till 2011 and it's a little better now but not much one observes that uh, the prevalence per 10000 has definitely gone down all over the world from 1.6 to 0.34 also in india it's come down from 6.7 to 0.66 and um, in 2011 the prevalence showed that 0.083 million patients of leprosy was the prevalence per 10000 of which 9.5% were children this is a fairly big number if you converted into the total numbers in figures across the country <clears throat> so if we want to make a dent in the diagnosis of leprosy so that we are able to finally contain the disease uh, knowledge of the natural history is important and what happens is that it's usually 2 to 3 years after infection that the earliest clinical signs develop which are apparent to an experienced observer of course it's after 1 to several years that the determined clinical leprosy develops which is of course very obvious now if we want to contain this disease action should be taken here and not here and the cross disease disability and deformity is the last stage which can be diagnosed by any person but particularly in children if action is to be taken it should be taken here what happens when there is inoculation of the leprosy bacillus inside the body there may be no disease which is complete resistance from the body side as good body defenses there may be clinical disease which develops to the indeterminate lesion and which could go on to the tuberculoid end of the spectrum or to the lepromatous end depending upon the cell mediated immunity which is good here and not good there this indeterminate lesion may persist indefinitely get cured by drug or spontaneously so this is what happens to the leprosy bacillus and once it is inoculated into the body now uh, uh, just a brief outline is that in the tuberculosis disease the bacilli are absent in the lesions in the lepromatous disease of course there are bacilli present in billions this is just textbook data this shows what happens in the uh, lesions across the spectrum with tuberculosis disease at one end of the spectrum and lepromatous disease at the other end of the spectrum um the lesions are 1 to 3 in number in the tuberculosis end many in the lepromatous side 
dry lesions, shiny lesions there. There is loss of hair here, hair are present there. Sensation is absent here, but normal there. And the AFP per lesion, there are hardly any here, but lots of many AFBs per lesion there. Uh, these are the relatively unstable areas of leprosy. And if the body's defense, that is the CMI, goes down, they could move towards the lepromatous end. And if the CMI improves, they move towards the tub tuberculoid end of the spectrum. A few pictures. This is a lesion of a child with tuberculoid leprosy, which is on treatment. So you can see the very clear-cut demarcated margins of the lesion. And of course, there is complete anesthesia in the central part of the lesion. The indeterminate leprosy, which is visible here, as you would note that it's a very ill-defined margin here, a hyperpigmented macular lesion, which is present over the forearm of this child. And uh, it is this which is a starting lesion. And as I mentioned earlier, it could move towards any side, either the tuberculoid or the lepromatous side. Of course, this is the full-blown picture of uh, borderline lepromatous leprosy, where you find many lesions, confluent, loss of eyebrows, flattening of the nasal bridge, thickening of the lips, thickening of the ear lobules, and multiple lesions which are confluent present all over the body. Um, going into the clinical profile and how the diagnosis has changed, I fell in love with mycobacterium leprae about 20 years ago. And why that happened is a small story that uh, as a pediatrician, whenever I would see a patch in a child which was a hyperpigmented macule, I would write off an antibiotic cream, a steroid cream, and prescribe some multivitamins. And the same happened in a child who did not respond and ended up with my dermatologist, who happened to be my teacher. He called me up, really fired me up, and said, how is it possible that when I've taught you leprosy, you missed out a leprosy lesion? So that was the time I decided that once our country is leading the world in leprosy, of course our country is leading the world in many other unfortunate things, but it's also leading the world in leprosy. So I decided that, well, pediatricians must know about leprosy in children, and that's why I went into it. And we have been looking at it for the last over 20 years now. The majority of cases fall in the 12 to 16 years age group and of the borderline and the borderline tuberculoid variety. And there's been an insignificant change in the clinical profile over the last 20 years. These are just some of our publications on leprosy in children. Coming to the main point, which is diagnosis, it very, looks very simple that at least two of the first three cardinal signs given below or the last sign independently. That is characteristic skin lesions, partial total loss of sensation in the skin lesions, thickened nerves and AFB present in the skin lesions or the nasal smear. Now, I may tell you that the skin lesions may not be characteristic. They may resemble a fungal lesion. They may resemble a vitamin deficiency. They may, I mean, so to have characteristic skin lesions in leprosy in children is not always the story. To test sensation in children, if you touch a child with a pin, he's going to run away. He's not going to allow you to touch. Thicken nerves. To palpate thicken nerves, even in adults, requires a lot of experience. So to palpate thicken nerves in children, young children, requires a lot of experience, and there is a lot of subjective variation. So it's not easy to say that, yes, I could find thickened nerves. Then, ladies and gentlemen, leprosy in children is a possible vascular disease. To find the number of AFB in the skin smears or the nasal smears is very low. In other words, diagnosis, as per the cardinal signs, etc., which is there for the last over 20 years, is easier said than done. This is, of course, what a mycobacterium lepre looks like on a zero nasal stain. So how has the early diagnosis of leprosy undergone the revolu revolution in the last two decades? Clinical suspicion, clinical suspicion, and clinical suspicion is the most important area. Smears for AFB should be taken and uh, are important, but of course, not very valuable. Serology came in and went out. It's like serology of any other infectious diseases. You have malaria present in the body, and the serology is negative. You have typhoid present in the body, the serology is negative. Similarly, serology came in, and none of the tests of serology stood the test of time, and they are now in the dustbin. Histology, of course, is very important. Conventional histology, very, very important indeed. But not many parents would agree that the child's skin lesion is subjected for histopathology. And more important than that, when our histopathological colleagues come out with the diagnosis, nonspecific histopathology, not confirmatory. It is very, very frustrating indeed. So there's definitely a requirement that we look at other tests. And that's what I've been, I will tell you in the next few slides, what we've been trying to do.
uh, with in-situ hybridization, in-situ PCRs, gene probes, and PCR in the diagnosis of leprosy in children. This was one of our very first studies which we carried out, which was on the prevention and early diagnosis of leprosy, published a few centuries ago, in which we looked at a, a five years follow-up study on healthy contacts of leprosy, because it is very, very important that we look at the contacts of leprosy patients, because these are the children who are likely to develop the disease, if not uh, looked at early enough. So we looked at this five years follow-up study to detect subclinical infection and observe the development of overt disease during using the FLABS technique and the lepromin test, and then evaluate the efficacy of uh, coma prophylaxis with Dapson in the at-risk contacts. This is what immunofluorescence looks like under the microscope. And uh, we had these 455 healthy contacts, less than 15 years of age, who were contacts of confirmed patients of adult leprosy. We divided them into four groups, those who were FLABS positive and lepromin negative, FLABS positive, lepromin, uh, sorry, lep both positive, FLABS positive, lepromin negative, FLABS negative, lepromin positive, and both negative. Now this indicated that infection had taken place and there was a good CMI. Indicated infection taking place, poor CMI. No infection taking place, good CMI. No infection taking place, bad CMI. We followed up these children for five years, periodically examining them and put them on a Dapson prophylaxis. And the results were that it was in this group where the FLABS was positive and lepromin was negative, that out of 166 children, 70 children who did not receive Dapson prophylaxis, 12 developed the disease. Out of the 96 children who received prophylaxis, only six developed the disease. Um, these contacts were divided into two groups, the high risk and the low risk groups. And the results showed that the Dapson prophylaxis was more efficacious in the high risk group of patients as compared to the low risk groups. So which led us to summarize that these two tests are of immense value for the identification of at risk population in the field and chemoprophylaxis with Dapson plays an extremely significant role in prevention of leprosy in children. Then came the story of gene probes. This is in the early 90s that the gene probes came in and really revolutionized the diagnosis of leprosy. Now in this particular study, we looked at the clinical profile of leprosy and uh, detected the nucleic acids of M. leprae in skin lesions of clinically suspected patients using gene probes. And in this study, we had 651 patients and 40 controls. Um, clinical smear history and everything was done, and lepromin tests along with skin biopsy and gene probe studies were done in 100 patients in all the controls. The age distribution showed that maximum number of patients fell in the 11 to 16 years age group. The lesions increased with age, and majority of the patients had macular hyperpigmented lesions. Nerve thickening was present in 301, that is almost 50% of the children. Correlation. We had two probes looking at different nucleic acid sequences of M. leprae. And what this data shows is that out of the 100 children we studied, those children who were smear positive, that was 38, probe 1 picked up 35, probe 2 picked up 30. Now both these gene probes were looking at different nucleic acid sequences of M. leprae. What is important is here that those children who were smear negative, that is 62, 40 were picked up by probe 1 and 31 were picked up by probe 2. All this data was, of course, statistically significant. Uh, correlation with histopathology, 30 children were subjected to a histopathology. And uh, look at the probe results. 24 were picked up by probe 1 and 16 by probe 2. It was important is that those children who had a report of non-specific histopathology, both of them were picked up by these probes. This was the starting time when gene probes were coming in for the diagnosis of leprosy. And of course, well-established probes are now present for uh, diagnosis of uh, unconfirmed cases at the tertiary referral centers. In summary of this study, the uh, incidence increased with age, smear positivity increased, and all smear positive and lepromin positive cases, majority of smear negative cases were detected by the probes, and nine patients, four with indeterminate histology, and five with nonspecific uh, and inconclusive histopathology were detected by these probes. Next comes the story of PCR and in situ hybridization. We published the study about five years ago. And uh, what is in situ hybridization? Not radioactive gene probes specific to the 36 kilodalton gene of M. leprae are used for histological specimens. If complementary nucleic acid strands of M. leprae are present in the specimen, 
the probe joins at the site, which is hybridization, which is indicated by a color change brought about by an immunoenzymatic reaction and confirms the diagnosis. It allows concomitant study of the histopathology and augments the sensitivity of the histopathological diagnosis. In this particular study, of course, we have added on cases now, we had 22 children and see the skin smear for AFB was positive in only two. The histopathology was confirmatory in only six. That means 16 children had a histopathology which was non-specific. When we looked at the histo in situ hybridization, it turned out to be positive in 10 out of these 22 children. PCR, I uh, would like to say this is the conventional PCR which was done on 15 children out of these 22 and 10 turned out to be positive. So this was one of the very few first studies which were carried out in our country on in situ hybridization. And this is what it looks like in the tissue specimen where the nucleic acid, the, the, uh, the strands are present and the reaction turns out as a blue dot in the skin lesions. So the summary of this study on the diagnosis of leprosy was that PCR and in situ hybridization significantly improved the diagnostic yield in early cases and in those with a nonspecific histopathology. Then again, another milestone came in the diagnosis of uh, leprosy and this was about in situ PCR. PCR for the diagnosis of leprosy has been there for quite some time, but this is in situ PCR and uh, this is in fact one of, our pine one of the pioneer studies on the diagnosis of leprosy in children in which in situ PCR detects the amplified DNA and RNA products within the cell. It allows localization of low level of nucleic acid within the tissue and of course augments the sensitivity of uh, histopathological diagnosis. The advantages of in situ PCR over in vitro PCR which is the conventional PCR is that it provides structural correlates and it permits concomitant study of the tissue pathology. And most important of all, there is no contamination by foreign RNA and DNA. A major drawback with the conventional PCR is whether that is employed for the diagnosis of dengue fever, which is employed for the diagnosis of malaria, or for anything is that contamination takes place by foreign DNA and RNA. And that is very, very frustrating. Similarly, when doing in vitro PCR for the skin lesions of uh, Mycobacterium leprae, it becomes very frustrating if we have contamination. So this was overcome by this technique. And this is what in situ PCR looks like. We have the positive sites within a dermal nerve. In this particular study, which was a pioneer study, we had 20 children. And the skin smear for AFB was positive again in only two. The histopathological diagnosis was positive in nine, of which the seven were smear positive and two was smear negative in the histopathological specimens. The histopathology was non-specific in 11 out of these 20 children. When we did the in situ PCR, it turned out to be positive in 12 out of these 20 children. Um, results of in situ PCR in children with a non-specific histopathology were that out of these 20 children, the histopathology, as I mentioned, was positive in only nine, and in situ PCR was positive in four out of these 11 children. So the cases confirmed by both histopathology and in situ PCR were 13 out of 20, which is all 65%. So histopathology in this particular study confirmed the clinical diagnosis in 45% of the total cases, and in situ PCR confirmed the diagnosis in 60%, thus enhancing the diagnostic yield. So this is what I've tried to show you how the uh, sophisticated tests have come in the early diagnosis of leprosy in children over the last 20 years. Now this is something which we are doing these days and it's an ongoing study in our department and this is on RLEP PCR. In most conventional PCR targets, the amplicons are large. For example, the 36 KDA yields about 530 base pairs in which DNA may be get fragmented or damaged during the processing. The RLEP based PCR yields 129 base pairs. This RLH gene is repeated 28 times in the Mycobacterium leprae chromosome, whereas 36 KDA has only one copy per cell. Studies in adults have shown higher positivity with RLEP PCR as compared to conventional PCR. So we are carrying out these studies, and I'll show you some of our results. Again, this is pioneer work because 
No studies have been carried out or published on the value of RLEP PCR in the diagnosis of leprosy in children. Uh, till now, we have looked at phase 73 patients with 32 age matched controls. DNA extraction is done from the slit skin smears and the nasal swab specimens. Uh, out of these 73 children, we have 49 children who are between the 20, uh, 10 to 16 years of age. And these are some of the results which we have. 73 children, this is the breakup, borderline lepromatous 11, of course the maximum chunk being contributed by the borderline group, then borderline tuberculoid and so on. The smear positivity for AFB was, it was positive at only 17 out of these 73 children. But look at the PCR positivity in skin scraping. This is the RLEP PCR. Positive in 56% uh, in 56 children out of these 73, which is almost 76.7%. All the controls, I'm sorry this is uh, 30 to what I mentioned, is not 20 here. So this is just to say that RLEP PCR is again very, very encouraging and offers very high statistical significant results in the diagnosis of leprosy. Uh, looking at the comparison of RLEP PCR with uh, histopathology, we looked at the histopathology in four children. PCR positive was four in all of them. Histopathology was conclusive in only one and inconclusive in three. As I mentioned, this is a very frustrating experience. Comparison of RLEP PCR with nasal swabs and skin smears. Um, in this particular study, we had 22 children. The nasal smear was positive for AFB in only two. PCR was positive in the nasal swab in 10. But of course, in the skin scrapings, it turned out to be positive in 17. All the controls were negative. So the summary of this RLEP PCR is that RLEP based PCR on skin smears can be a useful tool to confirm early cases of leprosy where skin smears are negative and the skin biopsy is not feasible. So ladies and gentlemen, I've tried to take you through a journey of uh, over 20 years in which we have been trying to look at leprosy in children. Uh, we are wiser because uh, we have understood leprosy in children better than what we knew about it 20 years ago. And uh, based on our findings, of course, and of course on the base of international studies, and let me tell you, not many studies have been carried out on the early diagnosis of leprosy in children in the world because most of the cases are concentrated in Africa and India. Um, the most important thing is, of course, clinical suspicion. And as I teach my students and my residents that uh, do not discard a child who presents to you with a hypopigmented macule, do not say this is just a fungal infection or a vitamin B deficiency. It could be leprosy. Be careful. And if there is a doubt, go ahead with the smear. If the smear is AFP positive, you're lucky. In the majority, it's going to be negative. And if so, employ these tests, which are now available at the tertiary centers. And uh, if one can confirm the diagnosis of leprosy by using these tests, just on a smear alone, one is lucky and uh, the diagnosis is made. If not, then one can go for histopathology. If it's characteristic, which as I've tried to show you, it's not in the majority of children, then one can go ahead with in situ hybridization, which if positive, fine. Otherwise, one can go on with in situ PCR. The experience with in situ PCR, RLEP PCR, in situ hybridization for the diagnosis of leprosy in children in our country is very limited. That is why the algorithm still stands as a suggested algorithm and not as a perfect algorithm for the diagnosis of leprosy in children. So with these few words, I'd like to conclude and say that childhood leprosy still exists and needs attention. Early diagnosis is extremely vital. It is vital because the child has not many years to live. If it is neglected and the child goes on to develop deformities, it is a very sad story. And now, with gene probes and PCR widely available at the tertiary centers, diagnosis can be, diagnosis is not difficult, especially in the smear negative cases. Thank you very much indeed.